Hello and welcome to Lady Dynamite Creates. This is Tiffany. Today we're going to be working on Vi, the Piltover Enforcer. I was super excited after seeing all of the trailers for the Arcane series on Netflix. So without further ado, here comes Vi. For the base doll, I chose Venus. I felt like her face shape most closely resembled the concept art. Venus does have a shaved side, but unfortunately it's on the wrong side, so we'll have to address that later. This doll is missing her forearms and her hands. Fortunately, we're going to be giving her some pretty awesome Hextech gauntlets, so we don't need the hands. We will be using this spare set of Frankie arms to use as base for the gauntlets, though. I start getting her prepped for painting, and the first thing I do is remove all of her hair with a shaver. I dunk her down into some extremely hot water. This just helps the vinyl get nice and soft so I can easily pull off her head. The hot water also loosens up the glue that's holding on her flocking, so in the event that you want to remove flocking from a doll but don't want to damage the factory paint, this is a great option, so you're not having to use acetone and risk an acetone mishap. I scrape out all of the hair plugs with a flathead screwdriver, and once I have all of those plugs loosened, I use my needle nose pliers to pull out all the hair. This particular hair actually had no glue. I was really surprised it's the first time I've run across one like this. It seems like the hair was actually knotted inside instead of glued. It was very nice and clean. Using 100% acetone, cotton pads, and q-tips, I remove all of her factory face paint. Venus here has some very unique molding. Her ears are shaped like little ridges on a leaf. And while this molding is very beautiful, it is not what I need, so I use my X-Acto blade to slice off the tips of these leaves. Once I have the bulk of it cut down, I can take a diamond burr bit with my Dremel and start smoothing out any of those ridges and roughness where I've cut. This takes a lot of patience and you need to go at a slow speed because too high of a speed will melt the vinyl. And here you can see after all the sanding and carving, she has a pretty normal looking ear. So now one down, one to go. In preparation for her reboot, I give her scalp a couple of coats of acrylic paint. I was a little disappointed that the neutralizing effect that pink has on green that the color didn't dry exactly what I wanted. Now to prep some yarn to make her hair. I had this hot pink and while it would have been an acceptable color, I felt like it needed to have a little bit of variation just to give the hair a little bit more life. So I'm going to be combining it with some of this magenta purple. I'm going to be preparing this a little differently than I normally do just because I had some of this previously cut from another custom. I'm just taking these separated out strands, gently brushing each end and flat ironing them. And then I'm going to be pulling in some of the purple using the pulled yarn method. I tried to grab the sections out of that other yarn that were more pink than the purple. And I didn't use very much of it in the hank overall. I just wanted to have some slight variation and highlight in the pink. And to me, it turned out to be such a beautiful color and just perfect for a buy. Now to reroute. I have marked onto the doll where the edge of the hairline is for her shaved side. So I'm going to start plugging in holes there. I slide the yarn onto the needle and just plug it down into the holes. One advantage to having a hank of loose fiber like this to reroute with, I hold the hank and then I just grab a section of fibers at the very tip and then just pull. And that gives me a plug size piece to just plop down in there. When I get to the area that has no holes, I don't bother with pre-punching any. The vinyl is soft enough that I can easily punch through it with my rerouting tool. I do, however, make sure that I'm not punching them too closely together because if you get them too close, you're going to wind up ripping the vinyl because you're putting that stress on it when you're poking through. When her head is completely rerouted, I apply some liquid fusion glue down into the neck hole. I use a Q-tip to swirl it around and make sure I'm touching all of those yarn plugs. We don't want them falling out later when we're styling it. Now to prep the body, which of course means my favorite activity, sanding. Lots and lots of sanding. We're going to be changing the doll's color, so we do need to have a nice matte finish to apply that Mr. Super Clear to. I start out with a really rough grit of sandpaper, and then with each pass, I go finer and finer. Before you know it, she's nice and smooth. I'd already done some test prints and figured out Vi's gauntlets were going to be a little bit too heavy for her to be fully articulated. Every time I was putting them on there for a test fit, they would just slide right down and wouldn't hold a pose. I'm going to super glue these joints into a bent position. The arm itself will still be able to move. That joint will still be able to swivel. It just won't be able to bend. This will help with keeping her arms up so that we can have her in a fighting boxer pose. Now onto her face up. 
These are all the colors that I used in her face up, and those four pastels in the far left are the ones that I used to change her skin tone. I've prepped her with two coats of Mr. Super Clear, and I'm using a big fluffy brush to apply the pastels. I'm making sure to get the face good and coated. Once I've got her completely coated, you can see I've got pretty good coverage. However, if we're working with such light colors, as soon as we spray it with Mr. Super Clear, it just takes away a lot of that coverage we had. We're working with a very dark doll with light colors that we're wanting to change her to, so we're having to use more coats than I would normally use on a skin tone change. All in all, I had to do five layers, and on some of the lighter skin dolls, I can usually get away with three. I could have probably gotten away with four layers, but when I sprayed it, there were still a couple of areas that had a little bit of a green tint showing through, and she was coming out a little bit darker than I wanted, so I did another pass of a very pale pastel. Now that she's the right color, we can begin on her face up. I begin with sketching in the eyes first, and I'm using a light gray for the top, and then I'm using a pink for the bottom portion. It's important to take your time and go slowly. We really want to make sure these eyes are symmetrical and that they match the shape that we want. It's a lot easier to fix it at this stage rather than waiting a little while down the road when we realize, oh, this one's higher or this one's bigger. While it's not impossible to change it later, it's just a lot harder. I'm using a wet paintbrush here to help clean up my lines that got a little bit wonky. It lifts the stray watercolor just off the surface. I sketch her irises in with a gray watercolor pencil, and I liked how in the concept art, the artist had drawn her eyes kind of glancing off to the side, so I wanted to replicate that here. Once I finally get the irises exactly how I want them, I move on to shading out her face. I'm using my stubby little brush to contour around her eyes, her nose, mouth, and ears. And I often get asked about this brush, and this brush is just a standard paintbrush that I have cut down. If you wanted to create one of these brushes for yourself, I have found that the stiffer bristled brushes do better. The soft ones tend to just fold in on themselves a bit, and you wind up just rubbing the metal tip onto the doll's face, which can scratch it up. The exact one that I'm using is a Michaels brand Artist Loft Necessities. It is a size 1 brown tip. With a white pastel, I highlight the tops of her cheekbones. I also hit her cupid's bow and the area just around her eyes. I do a light dusting of pink to her cheeks. I color in her lips with some magenta pastel. I'm applying this just towards the center of the mouth and blending it out towards the more neutral skin tone towards the edge of the lip. Her concept art shows her sucking on a sucker, and I'm thinking that this was supposed to be the cherry stain on her lips. I really loved how it looked on the concept art, so it was something I wanted to replicate here. I put down a base of pink eyeshadow, but before I move on and build up more color, I define her eyelid crease with a dark gray watercolor pencil. Next, I start going in with my darker purples and pinks and even some blacks to add some more dimension to her eyeshadow. I use a Q-tip to help blend the pastels. This just makes the transitions between the different colors more natural. Over the course of the doll, I did a lot of building up of the eyeshadow shades. I don't usually show every time I build up more color like this because it just becomes a little bit repetitive. But if you're interested in seeing the full length videos of my face ups, go check them out on my newly launched Patreon. I've set it up so that all of my Patreon members get access to all of my photos and behind the scenes pictures and videos. I also have tiers that include custom painted figures from me, mystery supply boxes, 3D prints, and more. I use a gray watercolor pencil to define the outside edge of the waterline. I color in the tear duct and the outside corner with a red. I darken her eyeliner with a black watercolor pencil. I add some detail lines to the lips. I fill in her scleras with my tried and true Karen Dice Supercolor white watercolor pencil. This pencil is excellent. I begin blocking in the color for her irises, and I'm using a dark blue to do the outer ring, and then a pale blue in the center. I use my white watercolor pencil to highlight some of those areas on her face that I really want to pop, and I really want to call attention to the highlight right around her eyes, because in the concept art it seems like those are very brightly highlighted. When I'm satisfied with the placements of all of my highlights, I blend them with a Q-tip so they're not quite as harsh of a line. With a brown watercolor pencil, I'll do a bit of shading where her nose ring will be, and I darken up her nostrils. The last thing I do on layer one is highlight those cheekbones with some pastel. 
On to layer two, it's a fresh layer, so I'm going to start with her eyebrows. I tend to do a lot of erasing with my eyebrows, so I need to make sure it's a fresh layer. Nothing like messing up some eyebrows and then erasing and erasing all of your eyeshadow too. I dust my pastel on with a flat-sided brush, and then I clean it up with my pencil eraser. One thing to remember when working on eyebrows is they don't naturally grow symmetrical, so if they're a little bit off, it's important that they're sisters, not twins. I highlight her brow bone with some white, to really enhance the lollipop look, I'm using a wet brush to lift pigment directly off the pencil and applying it to the lips. I dust the center of the iris with a dark blue, then I add in her black pupils. I start off layer 3 by adding some dark blue striations to the iris, and then I go back into a pass with white as well. This does mean that I need to darken back up her pupil, so I use my Derwent ink tints and fill that back in. This is the darkest black I have and it's so rich and intense. With a dark gray watercolor pencil, I shade in her scleras. This just gives some roundness to the eye. With watercolor lifted directly off of the pencil, I go in and add some light pink hairs to her eyebrows. Then with a darker pink, I add in a few more. I deepen the shading on her eyes some more with some black pastel. I add in her lower lashes and I'm using a Faber-Castell Aquarelle black pencil. This one is a very hard lead so it allows me to get a very sharp point on it so it's great for doing lashes. I always do my initial pass on lashes with this pencil. I'm able to get the point so fine that I can get those nice wispy ends. When I'm satisfied with my bottom lashes, I go ahead and tackle the top. As a final pass on all of the lashes, I use my Derwent ink tints to just fill in towards the bottom. This just gives a nice, thick, lush lash line. With some white watercolor, I add in her catch lights, and I'm just doing a couple of dots in her pupil. After that, I start adding in some highlights to around her face, and I'm going to give her a few right around her tear duct and waterline. I'm also going to hit the tops of her lashes. On layer 4, I'm going to sketch in her tattoo, and the only reason there is a layer 4 is I forgot to do this on the layer 3. <laughs> so I'm sketching in the placement for her Vi tattoo. I'm using a gray watercolor pencil to sketch in my design, and when I'm happy with it, I do a pass with black. I do one final pass with my Derwent ink tints just to get that really dark black. With the face up done, we can remove her hair from the wrap and get started on hairstyling. I plop her down onto my stand and I take an X-Acto blade and start razoring the hair. I hold the tip of the hair and I run the X-Acto blade down it towards my fingers. I do this all over making sure that I am positioning the blade at different points on the hair so that I get that short layered style that Vi has. Short in the front, long in the back. When I'm satisfied with the cut I've got, I need to add in her dreads that are in the back. I divide the hair into small sections and spray hairspray onto my fingers and start working that and twisting it into that section and then hit it with a hair straightener. This sets, sets that dread in place. I do several of these all over the back of the head. I begin to style the hair using a wet toothbrush. I'm just combing it out into different sections and creating that layered look. Finally, with her face up finished and her hair styled, we can address that shaved side. I apply a liberal amount of Mod Podge to the area I want to flock, and once I'm happy with the coverage, I start dumping on some powdered flocking. I could have made the flocking out of some yarn that I had, but I did have this, and it was in the perfect color, so why not use it? And the powder is so fine, it works beautifully. I did have to do a couple of coats of it because I did have a few patchy places. 
To apply her nose piercing, I'm dotting on some Gem Tac glue. The stuff dries clear, so it's perfect to use on the face. And then I'm just affixing a nail art gem. To make her ear piercings, I'm taking this nail art rectangle and I've cut it in half and I'm curling it around my jewelry pliers into a little half round piece, affixing it with Gem Tac glue and just squeezing it onto the ear with my tweezers. Now time to work on her clothes. I knew in order for everything to fit properly, I was going to have to work in layers and I was gonna to have to start at the bottom layer and work my way up. The first thing I'm working on is her leggings and I couldn't find any stretchy material that was in this gray pinstripe, so I'm gonna to have to create my own. I'm using a straight edge and an off-brand Copic marker and I'm sketching out my design on a piece of fabric. After I have my design in place, I'm going to heat set it with my iron on the highest setting. I'm pressing this on both the front and the back. This sets the ink and will keep it from rubbing off onto the doll. I've used this technique before in cosplay and I designed a shirt and pants with some stitching and some scales drawn in these Copic markers. And once it was dry and heat set, there was no transfer. I did have a little amount of fading once it was washed, but that's to be expected with any kind of thing like this. Once the ink is set, I can draw on my pattern pieces. I'm using this very odd looking pattern here because I wanted her to have a seam up the back and I wanted to have no twisting to the stripes. I wanted to keep them very vertical. When the right side's facing, I sew up that U-shaped crotch seam. Once in place, I can trim the excess. This was the third time I made these leggings. My first time, the cut just didn't look right. The second time, the stripes just didn't show up well enough. So third time's a charm. I bring the top leg up out of the way and on the bottom leg, I bring right side's facing and sew up that side seam. I've made sure this is a good fit and then I've cut away any excess. Don't cut until you've made sure it's right because it's easier to make adjustments when you've got this extra still there. I pull right side spacing on the other leg and then I sew down those seams as well. I am trying to cut down on bulk so I did not put in a waistband to these and I also wound up cutting off the feet of this and turning them into leggings because of the extra bulk that it was creating in the shoe. I've created her shorts from an altered pants pattern from Moonlight Jewels Miniature Sewing. Highly check it out, it's a great resource. I sew the decorative stitches onto the butt. I attach the fronts to the backs at the side seams. Like I said, we're trying to cut down on bulk, so I am flattening out all of my seams. It makes for a cleaner sewing job anyway, so it's a good practice to have. I sew the cuffs onto the two panels. With right sides facing, I sew the two panels together down the center front. I'm careful not to sew down that teeny tiny edge that is the leg of the shorts. With the right side spacing, I sew up that back seam to the marked point. That is the point in which they will no longer fit over her hips if I keep going, so I use a pin to mark it more clearly. I sew up the crotch seam and then I add a hook and eye closure to the back and these shorts fit like a glove. To start construction on the corset, I sew in the decorative stitches onto the center front panels and then I sew those together at the center front seam. I sew the center front panel to the side front panels at the princess seam. I attach the front piece to the two back pieces at the side seams. I gather up this purple and pink fabric to create ruffles and then I'm going to attach that to the bottom edge of the corset. I apply some fabric fusion glue to this silver ribbon. I'm going to be adding this as a decorative trim to the edge and I'm just using my flat iron to help activate that glue and set it. I had such a hard time with every piece of clothing on this doll. I know I made everything at least twice. <laughs> I trim away the excess ribbon and heat seal the edge. I reinforce the back placket area where the eyelets are going to be for the lace up. I secure it with fusible interfacing. I was finding the fabric wanted to separate at the seams and just pull apart and I knew this area would have a lot of stress on it and I really didn't want everything to just fall apart on me as I go and tighten up the corset. I've tried it onto the doll and marked where the edge of the corset should be. I use that as a guide as I'm marking the placement for the eyelets. I'm pushing my all through at the mark. This is creating a spread between the threads rather than cutting them. This means the bond where the eyelets are attached is gonna be stronger and less likely to fall out with time. I place my eyelet into the hole and then I put it pretty side down into the anvil portion and then using the little stick, I hammer it in. I swear, I hate doing grommets. I never wanna do them again. Two down, eight more to go. With all of my eyelets finally in place, I can cut off all of the excess. Afterwards, I hit it with my flat iron just to remove all of those markings, and then I heat seal the edges to make sure I don't have any fraying.
Now we just need to start adding some of those details to our corset. I have these tiny pieces of ribbon that I've cut and heat sealed the edges on, and I'm going to be sliding these teeny tiny adorable little buckles onto and then adhering it to the corset with some fabric fusion glue. I place these down and then I use my flat iron to activate the glue and set it. I add some nail art gems to act as rivets onto the sides of those ribbons and I'm using gem tack glue to set those in place. For her belt, I'm going to cut a thin strip of this leather and I'm going to be using a belt buckle that I 3D printed. However, this was the only leather I could find that was thin enough, it's just not in the right color. So I'm going to prep it to paint it and to do this I first need to deglaze the leather and I'm using a little bit of acetone on a cotton pad and then just rubbing this down to prep the surface. Next I'm using this leather studio paint to paint it in a mixture of blackish brown. I finish it off with a velcro closure. For preparation in creating her chest armor, I dressed her and I've wrapped her body up into some cling film. I chose to use Warbler's Black Art to make her chest armor. She's going to have a lot of 3D printed parts, which are going to be a very smooth surface, and Black Art is smoother than traditional Warbler. I would like to eventually try their Pearly Art, which is supposed to be the smoothest of all, but that'll probably be down the line sometime. I'm applying heat with my heat gun, and then I mold it onto the body. I use a white watercolor pencil to sketch out all of the designs of the sculpting and ridges that I need to have on the armor. I like to use the watercolor pencil because if I make a mistake, I can just wet a q-tip and wipe that away. It's not permanently there. I pop this off the body so that I can start cutting away the excess around the outer edge and truing up the center back. I take some warbler scraps and I roll these out into very thin snakes. I'm using these to line the top and the bottom of the corset for some more detail. I heat both surfaces to activate the stickiness. This just helps with the application of these details. Okay, so if you haven't already watched the first three episodes of Arcane, as soon as you finish this video, go watch them. I'm so super excited about Saturday's new episodes coming up and I just, I can't wait. It's just such a great delve into that world and the background of those characters. It's really wonderful and I can't wait to see more. I made templates for the raised details and I'm heating them up and applying them to the chest piece. Once in place, I heat it up and I use my sculpting tools to add in all of those details and ridge lines. To get the surface of my warbler even smoother, I'm going to be applying a couple of coats of Flex Bond. This is a primer made specifically for warbler. I use these exact same steps to make her necklace choker. Now let's work on her red leather jacket. I'm going to be sewing these two back panels together at the center back seam, and I'm going to sew her collar together with right side spacing along the outside edge. I'm going to do a little decorative top stitching to these two seams. With right side spacing, I sew the back to the two front panels at the shoulder seam. I sew the collar onto the neck hole of the garment. I hem the sleeves and then I attach them to the armholes of the jacket. Now we flip right side spacing and we're going to sew up the side seams and the sleeves. The final thing I do to the jacket is fold under and glue the front and bottom edges. For her knee brace, I've cut this shape out of some hexagon fabric and I've cut out a center hexagon to be where her knee goes and I'm just sewing up that back seam. For 
her shoes, I did a little bit of experimentation. I designed this chunky sole pattern that's a little bit enlarged because I want to cover the main portion of the shoe in fabric and then I want to do a toe cover over the tip of the shoe. I've wrapped the shoe up into some paper tape and that is what I'm using to make a pattern and then I cut that out of my main fabric. I found that the stretchy fabric works a little bit better for this. It's easier to apply to the shoe and still get the foot in and out. I use some super glue onto the shoe itself and then I start applying my fabric just applying in small sections at a time, making sure that I cover all of the shoe that's necessary. It's more important that I go a little over than a little under because I can always cut off the excess, but I can't add more there. I use an X-Acto blade to cut off any of the excess around the edges. While I was working on the boot covers is when I realized I needed to turn my tights into leggings. My 3D printed shoes are made to either be used with very thin tights or just none. And these were on the cusp of being too thick, but with the added problem of trying to get them around the boot covers, I was just afraid I was going to wind up cracking the shoes. So I figured it was better to just cut the ends off and go with leggings instead. When the boot covers are in place, I can apply the toe covers with some super glue. I clean up any of the areas that were still a little rough from the print, as well as any of the areas that had super glue leakage. And here is why this video is a week later than planned. These 3D prints gave me such a hard time between issues with Max choosing to not export and just failed prints left and right. It was a nightmare, but everything finally turned out beautifully and they are so wonderful and I love all these parts. Now to get all of these pieces ready for painting. There were some rough areas where the supports were, so I'm going to be using the fine grit sandpaper to help smooth those out. I'm very careful with the sanding because I really don't want to remove any of the details that I've sculpted on. With everything nice and sanded, I clean away any dust particles with a wet cloth. I'll be priming these pieces with my AK Fine Primer. This is a primer specifically designed for painting miniatures. I'm using some sticky tack and tape to help hold these down while I'm spraying. I'm using a light misting and doing several thin coats. It's better to build the color up rather than just trying to get it all in one coat. This way you don't get any drip lines. Once the primer's dry, I apply some coats of silver spray paint. The majority of Vi's armor is silver, but it has gold accents, so now I take my acrylic paints and I'm basing out the areas that are going to be done in gold. I found that the gold paints tend to be a bit more sheer, so that they need that color underneath to really help them pop. I'm using a fine tip brush and I'm only applying small amounts of paint at one time. You don't want to put too much paint on your brush because it's going to just cause streaks in it. I take my time and go slowly, but for those mistakes where I get paint where it shouldn't be, I have wet q-tips handy. I am very happy with how smooth the chest armor turned out. While it's not quite as smooth as the resin, it is much smoother than traditional Warpla. It did take forever to get all of these pieces painted. There's just so many small details. The knee pad and the upper arm armor have a dirty steel look to them. To achieve it, I have brushed on some black acrylic, and then once it's partially dried, I'm taking a wet brush and start brushing off some of the excess. This gives the metal the look that it was once shiny and new, became dirty, but some of those bits have scratched away and you still see the silver underneath. I'm using a piece of tape to help hold it onto my finger. For the final gold color, I wasn't quite sure which direction I wanted to go. The concept art has it as a champagne gold, while the in-game model is a very orange gold. I used one of my mini misprints here to help decide on the color that I wanted to use. Ultimately, I landed on a color that's somewhere in between the concept and the in-game art. I've decided to mix together this emperor's gold with this metallic taupe. 
Then I begin the long task of painting all that gold detail again. This will be my third coat because I did need to do two coats of the base color and then I do one top coat of gold. With the gold now complete, I can start adding in those details. There's only a few places that need them. There's the dials on her gauntlets and her backpack, and I just paint in the little red slashes and paint the dial black. Her shin guards actually have a pink gradient on them, so I bust out my airbrush and start putting that on there. I did have to be very careful when I was airbrushing these on because I found that the silver paint that I used caused even the smallest amount of airbrush paint to run. So I had to do it in very light layers. There were a couple of times I had to start over and wipe away the paint because it was starting to pool. Finally, after a ton of really thin coats, I have the look that I want. Now my favorite detailing part is painting on her sketched in by on her shoulder pads. While this wasn't on the end game model, it was on her concept art, so I really wanted to add it. I sketch in the placement for the letters VI with a pencil. Next, I fill it in with some pink acrylic and start drawing in my paint runs. Now all this armor looks too nice and new and Vi's out there brawling, so we need to dirty it up. I apply washes of black acrylic paint and wipe away any excess. This is super fun because you don't have to be neat and accurate at all. You're scrubbing paint just all over the model down into the crevices and then wiping away excess. I do go in with a finer tip brush just making sure that I press it down into some of those cracks. You can see the before and after here and it's a huge difference. The black wash really made that sculpting pop. Now I can finally paint in all of her Hextech crystals. I'm using a blue metallic paint and I'm painting in the hollow where her crystal is in her chest armor. I'm also painting the sculpted gems that are in her gauntlets. I fill in the hollow of her chest with some UV resin and set it with my lamp. I also apply a thin layer of it to the gemstones on the gauntlets. I dust on some iridescent chameleon mica powder. I am going to permanently attach her backpack, shoulder pads, and upper arm armor to her jacket. I start out using hot glue, but quickly realize that these pieces are just pulling right up, so I have to switch over to using super glue. I think the coating that was on the leather was just keeping the hot glue from getting a good bond. I use hot glue to attach her gauntlets to her body as well. I'm making sure to attach these while still on the body so that I make sure everything is turned into the correct position. Really don't want to put these on the arm backwards. For the back portion of her leg armor, I'm using Warbla. I've wrapped her leg up into some cling film and I'm heating up my Warbla and I'm going to form it on there. I mark where I want the edges and raise design B, then I pop them off her leg and start trimming down the bits. With the edges trimmed down, I pop the armor back onto her leg and begin to sculpt out the details. I'm heating up the warbla and then using my sculpting tools to make those ridges. When the leg armor done, I can start getting it painted. I'm not going to be primering it this time beforehand because I felt like the texture worked well this time. I first give it a coat of black paint, then I go back and dry brush some gunmetal on top of that. I finish it off with some silver detailing right around the cuffs and the top edge. I apply this same treatment to her shoes. So now she's almost done and ready to get dressed. 
And this is one of the few times that I am making my doll's clothes permanently affixed. I don't do this often, but I was having trouble figuring out attachments that were going to be as flat as possible because of how many layers this was. I wasn't wanting to add that bulk. I really have never been so close to just giving up on a doll. Between having to make every single piece of clothing at least twice and all of the issues I was having with 3D Studio Max and failed prints, I, I really wanted to quit. I am glad I stuck with it because I do feel like she turned out to be my best piece I've worked on, but my word. I do feel like it is fitting that she's being gifted to my husband because honestly she wouldn't be finished if it wasn't for his constant encouragement telling me how great she's turning out and how wonderful it's going to be. I glue her shin guards and knee pads permanently in place with some hot glue. I lace up her corset and I knot it, then I trim off the excess ribbon and heat seal the edges. For her hip guards, I've glued two leather straps onto the front side. I then place them against her leg and then wrap them around and trim off the excess ends and then glue those in place. I did have to use some acetone on the back side of the armor so that the glue could adhere to it. While that silver was really beautiful, it did cause some issues when gluing on attachments. It was just really slippery. I attach two leather strips to the top front and top back of the hip guards too. These will be attaching directly to the corset and I'm going to be topping them off with a silver rivet. The straps on the side with the ruffle though, they get glued underneath. This doll was not only a beast to make, but she was a first for me. I had intended on selling her like I do all of my dolls, but this is the first time I've started one and then decided to keep her. The whole time I worked on her, he kept dropping hints about how cool she was and how it'd be awesome to have, and so I decided that I would gift him to him instead of selling her. She is, after all, his favorite character, and although he doesn't play much with her anymore, she was his first main. To attach her head, I'm going to be trimming down her neck peg, and then I use some pliers to fold under the flaps. With a little elbow grease, I slide the head on. There is a small amount of rub away right around the neck hole, but when you're doing a full skin color change, it's kind of unavoidable. If you notice, I didn't go over anything to do with her goggles in this video, and that's because I have a Patreon exclusive video that goes over all of the creation details on these. I went over how I created her lenses, which are see-through by the way, and all the trial and error that went along with that. Finally, I can put her gauntlets back on and Vi is complete. Thank you guys so much for watching and I appreciate your support here on YouTube. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. If you're interested in getting access to exclusive videos and behind the scenes content and a sneak peek at everything before it goes live on YouTube, be sure to check out my Patreon. The link is in the description box below. Be sure to stay tuned for some final photos. Remember, always be creating.